Well, what a weekend. I didn't... I spent a lot of time on the phone, a lot of time reading over the weekend, and at 3 o'clock yesterday afternoon, I attended a press conference, um, which was held by, well, the Prime Minister-designate, let's call him that, um, Chris Hipkins. And Carl is designated deputy, handpicked by him. It was, I must say, it's the 10th time I've been to a press conference for an incoming Prime Minister. And this one was uh, remarkable. Remarkable in that uh, it was an admission that in politics you go woke and you go broke. And a very clear signal from Chris Hipkins that the woke, more more woke aspects of this Labour administration will at least, in terms of its outward appearance, um, be reined in. That many policies that have been cornerstones and indeed uh, litmus paper or, or, or sparking points for public dissatisfaction uh, with the government are going to change. Perhaps three waters. Almost certainly the Radio NZ, TV NZ merger. And on co-governance, that most hoary of old political chestnuts, oh, a very cautious response from Chris Hipkins, a very cautious response that said co-governance perhaps wasn't always clear and hadn't been well explained. The role of the treaty? Well, he says we've got to put right the wrongs of the past. A very middle New Zealand attitude. But apart from that, really, Māori, it would seem, or things Māori, things treaty-related may not be as important to this Prime Minister and the administration that he leads as it was uh, to his predecessor, Jacinda Ardern. So what do we make of all this? What do we make of the amazingly rapid and bloodless appointment of Chris Hipkins and the changes that he is signalling, the reset that he is signalling? Well, we are joined first up this morning by the guy who I, I, I told you last week picked all this back in October the head of the Democracy Project and political lecturer at Victoria University, Bryce Edwards. Uh, Bryce, Bryce, thanks for joining us again and a very good uh, and happy Wellington anniversary morning to you. Thanks, Sean. Uh, you too. Yes, it's all been quite remarkable and I agree with um, pretty much your analysis on all that. This is a bit just for Labour and tinkering. Um, you know, this is about repositioning Labour away from the Grey Lynn sort of, of New Zealand and maybe you know, Wellington Central and more towards West Auckland, more towards the heart, you know, um, or a shift from the what you might say is the woking class through back to the, the working, working class. class. Woking class to yeah. working class. I really like that, Bryce. Look, Bryce, we had, well, a, brief, we had a brief chat yesterday. This has been remarkably efficient, remarkably well managed, no other candidate. It's almost like, Bryce, this was a setup. This was all planned some weeks ago. Well, I think we can say with some certainty that, um, you know, senior members of the government have been considering this for some time. Um, Ardern obviously didn't suddenly wake up um, last week and decide I'm off. Um, this has been something she's been discussing with um, people around her for for a long time. And Chris Hipkins is very close to the Prime Minister, uh, as with Grant Robertson. So I don't believe that Chris Hipkins uh, was shocked by her resignation announcement. Um, and he's been positioning himself to to get this role for quite some time. Uh, things are being lined up behind the scenes, um, and that's why things are going quite well now, I think. Well, Bryce, I'm going to go further. Is it possible, is it possible that Adern Hipkins and Robertson had been working on this very strategy and this very change prior to the public knowing anything about it? And, and I think back uh, to some yeah. conversations I had late last year with some of the people involved in this and I came away thinking something is up, but no one's saying. Yeah, I mean, things might have been a bit messier than the way you've just 
suggested, but uh, and maybe there were things up in the air. But I, I just think absolutely there would have been a lot of conversations involving Hipkins about how to make this happen in January. Um, I don't think he looks shell shocked. I don't think he looks like he's um, this has arrived out of nowhere. Uh, yeah, definitely there has been machinations going on. All right, so we've been kind of fibbed to, haven't we? Um. Yeah, maybe, but uh, I don't know. Politicians can't always start to allow these things out into public before they happen. And but I don't know, that's just politics. Um, as soon as you start saying these things, you know, the press, the media, the, the public want to know what the hell's going on. And um, so, of course, Ardern had to say, you know, repeatedly that she wasn't going, that she was in for the long haul. Um, you, you saw back in the 2017 election when Andrew Little started to, on the campaign trail, started to admit that he was having second thoughts, you know, about being prime minister, about being leader of Labour. And as soon as you start doing that, you you're know, stuffed. Um, you, you're stuffed. So I think Ardern was right to keep us in the dark if she was having some thoughts about going. Mm. Now, I, I went to that press conference yesterday, as I said, the 10th time I think I, I've seen a new Prime Minister standing up in the, in the theatre in, in my career. I thought, firstly, overall, it was a very competent and assured performance. Yeah, look, competency is going to be what voters are won back to Labour over in the next few months. Uh, it's it's the one area that I think a lot of people that voted Labour in the last two elections feel a bit let down, um, and there's a mood for politicians that just deliver things, get things done, fix it politicians. And really that's what we saw from Hipkins yesterday. Um, he's a no-nonsense, um, sort things out sort of a guy, and that will really appeal to voters, I believe. He made the obligatory nod to the outgoing Prime Minister, to Jacinda Ardern. He said something about misogyny, something sort of slightly woke about it not being acceptable. But then, boy, did he move on quickly. There was no uh, lingering looking in the rear vision mirror. And maybe not by specific substance, but I thought, Bryce, he delivered a very clear message that Labour under him or this government under him is going to have a quite different set of priorities than those that were perceived or Jacinda Ardern's administration was perceived to have. Yeah, I think that's absolutely the case. Um, for better or worse, correctly or not, the current government, I think, has become perceived as being one of sort of social engineering, political correctness, woke politics, whatever you want to call it, um, social justice, uh, a focus on things that aren't the, the big issues for voters at the moment, which is the economy, uh, health, education, crime, maybe, jobs. That's the sort of areas that Hipkins is obviously going to focus on. It's all about the economy. Um, so he made that very clear. Um, and, I mean, he, he will always be somewhat balanced in being um, attuned to the needs of, um, you know, different, yeah, so some of those more social concerns. Mm. But... Um, you know, he, he's part of the Labour Party. This you know? is for this is for your average bogan in the street in the lower hut government or out west, isn't it? Well, I, I think it, so, it's, yeah, that, the, it's middle yeah. middle New Zealand that he's pitching for. Yeah, I mean, the focus groups would have shown this. Um, the, all the market research that was being given to the inner circle of Labour in the last few months of the year would have shown that they need to get back to working people and working people's concerns um, and Ardern possibly didn't have the stomach to navigate um, the, yeah, things yeah. back to that Because area. she had uh, pinned her brand was so associated with the wokeism um, that yeah. for her the well, cost of then resigning from that and going back to more cloth, uh, you know, blue collar uh, cloth cap stuff uh, simply was more difficult for her. Yeah, she's more associated with Greyland than, than West Auckland. And I, I think it means there's going to be some difficult conversations 
to be had, especially with the Murray Caucus, um, especially with you know, the more kind of middle class liberal faction of Labour. And Chris Hipkins is up to that, whereby, yeah, whereas yeah. Ardern, I don't think, was. Yeah, Bryce, I think you've raised a really, really interesting point, and that is. What did the Maori caucus get out of this? Well, they basically, they got bugger all. Uh, Calvin Davies uh, effectively demoted because Carmel Cepoloni, who represents and reaches an entirely different demographic for, for the Labour Party, and that's the Pacifica community or the Pacific Island community, he is literally pushed aside uh, as a, a senior Maori member of, of caucus. He is pushed aside and he's left with this, I think, largely ceremonial role of being the deputy leader of, of, of the Labour Party. Kerry Allen isn't chosen by Hipkins to be uh, the deputy. And furthermore, in that press conference, a very interesting reaction when he's asked about co-governance and when he's asked about the treaty, first of all, uh, I, and I hate those gotcha questions, he can't name the third article of the treaty. Most New Zealanders couldn't um, name the first or second. Um, but also, when asked about co-governance, a bit of a pregnant pause. And then this, these words to the effect, well, I think it's misunderstood. We haven't always been clear about what it means. And... Uh, boy, I thought that was preparation to walk backwards very, very quickly. So Māori really... Um, their position, their influence in this Labor government seems as if it will be curtailed un uh, under Chris Hipkins. Look, there's so much uh, that's fascinating in what you've just said, uh, Sean, and so much to discuss. I mean, the first thing I would just point out is that um, there was an interesting poll that came out midway through last year. It was uh, commissioned by... Um, looking at Murray voters and what they care about. And um, at the top of the list was cost of living. Um, next were things like education, health, um, inequality. Um, right down the bottom of the list were things like treaty, uh, co-governance. Um, Murray don't necessarily have the same concerns, especially working class Murray, as uh, maybe the... People, the the radicals involved in political endeavour. I, I think this is yeah. a really interesting point you're making, Bryce. So, so what you're saying, so the calculation may be that e the average Māori in the street, if you like, isn't so different than other Kiwis in the street. And the calculation may have been made, well, let's fix the other things in their life rather than whether or not they're a sovereign nation and they ceded sovereignty and maybe they'll vote for us anyway. Yeah, that's pretty much it. So I don't think Chris Hipkins here is throwing Murray under the bus. I don't think he's shifting away from concern for fixing the lives of working class Murray people. Um, he might be throwing some of his Murray colleagues under the bus. He might be throwing some of the iwi leadership under the bus um, and shifting away from co-governance, maybe even dropping three waters. But that is not throwing Murray under the bus. Is the yeah, but come on, dropping three waters. What a red rag would that would be to people like Nanaya Mahuta. And I imagine, if you like, more radicalised or politicised um, parts of the Maori electorate would then look at the Maori Party as a better option. I, I think there's a sacrifice to be made in those circumstances. Yeah, look, it's, it's yet to be seen whether Three Waters is is under threat. Um, I'm seeing various different. Like, he didn't like commit to it, Bryce, did he? He, he did not. Um, and I see the likes of Andrew Vance today writing and stuff that she thinks it's it, it's gone, um, whereas others are saying it's safe. Um, but, yeah, certainly Hipkins uh, was, yeah, saying things like co-governance are uh, up for debate now, whereas they once weren't. Um, and, yeah, even on his inability to talk about the three articles of the treaty, you know, that was, that's been sort of reported as a great embarrassment. To him. Maybe it is. Um, I don't think it's something like that to the public. And I guess I'm a bit cynical about these things, and I sort of suspect that he does bloody know what the answers are to that. And he... Oh, he might have been deliberately uh, playing less Māori friendly yeah. than he is. Well, like I say, less treaty friendly, perhaps, uh, yeah. rather than less Māori friendly. Okay. Um, yeah, because... Yeah, 
But, no, yeah, some, something big is going on here. Um, and his whole tone, his whole presentation of what this new leadership is about. And you also noticed a lot more emphasis on playing up his his kind of working class background. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah the background. dirty dog sunglasses uh, or the wraparounds. I'm just a boy from Ugboot City. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, I'm not remarkable. saying it's inauthentic. I, I think it's quite real yeah. um, in some extent, extents, but I think he's also choosing to accentuate that side of things to try and connect back um, with the, the people that started to drift away from seeing Jacinda Ardern, you know, as this kind of global cosmopolitan, you know, hero of of the world's kind of liberals, to instead being the hero of the, the tea rooms and up heart, you know. I, I think that's a big shift. Yeah, and, and I guess, uh, and I, strangely enough, I thought of Mike Moore. Um, yeah, when I saw exactly. Hipkins Kiwi Battler, you know, the old Kiwi, I'm well, here for the Kiwi Battler. Well, Mike Moore was the last working class Prime Minister of New Zealand, and there haven't been one since. Um, so, I, I mean, I'm not sure about Chris Hipkins, how working class he really is. Yeah. He does come from relatively humble you know, background, that's that's for sure. Um, you know, but what he's doing now is, you know, he, he's been part of this political class, you know, of Robertson and all these other career politicians that, you know, go into student politics, then work in the beehive and then become career politicians. But he's now trying to, you know, separate himself from that sort of milieu, I yeah. think, in terms of image at least. Yeah. And maybe it's only maybe it's only positioning. Maybe it's only, you know... Yeah, well, that's my question to you, Bryce. Bryce, is this cosmetic? Um, or, or, or can he refocus and reset? Uh, is this going to be a great set for the Labour Party? I think, I mean, it's a bit hard, isn't it, to, to, to predict how the polls will go, but my gut feeling is that he's going to be quite popular and we'll see him as the most preferred Prime Minister in the next poll. Um, Labour will go up from from here. They might go even up into the high 30s and really is game on now. So um, I think he's also quite fortunate, um, as I've said to you before, that National's not actually that strong. Yes, they are beating Labour in the polls for the last you know, six months quite you know, uh, convincingly, but it's, it's quite, I think they've gained a lot of soft support off Labour. Yep. And National's not really that convincing as a, a government in waiting. Luxon's not that impressive. So yeah. Labour... Well, is, I, I is think... Well, you're good at this, Bryce, because you've raised, I think, the next interesting point. And that is that a reset in Labour towards the centre and towards the average Kiwi, and, and I, I think that's quite clearly what he's doing, occupies ground that Luxon was happy to sit and gather just by doing nothing, by being a small target, doing the McDonald's photos op, and, and kind of sleepwalking to victory. This change means that there is a, a genuine competition in the middle ground of New Zealand politics. And Luxon, it seems to me, is going to have to do more because he cannot rely on Labour under Jacinda Ardern losing this election. Isn't this, yeah, isn't that correct? I mean, they were sleepwalking to victory. They were being complacent. They weren't being pressured to actually come up with you know, policies and differentiation from Labour. Um, so, you know, they were getting flabby, um, whereas this will really give them a jolt. And of course, it's changed. And I think National wants to re, you know, think things and you know, come back with a new strategy, but they're going to have to. This is really uh, a wake-up call, and, and Luxon might not even survive this. I mean... Uh, what, are you uh, saying, oh, come on, come on, don't play that old lefty journalist uh, thing, Bryce. Do you think there's a leadership spill on the National Party? I, I don't... I wouldn't say that, no, but um, re previously he's looked 100% safe, now he's only 98% safe. Look, one of the things that came up, and I'm sorry, I just thought it was such a bullshit narrative... Um, in mainstream media over the weekend, uh, largely by female journalists, that this was the, the Prime Minister was the victim of misogyny. This is all terrible men, men, men. I actually look at Andrea Vance's piece this morning on those behind the scenes. It's a pretty male blokey 
you know, Carmel Cipollone is the, the exception. It's a pretty blokey uh, new administration. Was the uh, was Jacinda Ardern the victim uh, of a horrible spike of particularly nasty misogyny or not, Bryce? Yes, she was. Um, oh, horrible okay. Stuff get, uh, that is, it is. Horrible things get thrown at her. And there's all Horrif- the horrible stuff. things and get thrown at all politicians, Bryce. Absolutely, of course. It's it, and there's rising toxicity in politics at the moment. Yeah. The heat is raising. It's thrown at you. It's probably thrown at me online. Yeah. Um, and but I mean, we can't say that Ardern was uh, hounded from office, driven from office. Okay, she we put can't up say with that. that. She no, well, she wasn't a victim of this, and I think it's quite paternalistic or patronising to suggest that she was yeah. someone who's driven from office over this. She, I think, was up to um, dealing with some of that abuse, you know, um, yeah. as most politicians are. Um, I don't know. We do need a debate around um, civility in politics and, yeah. you know, how to deal with yeah. all these debates. And there was a bit of mansplaining but to, to other men from Chris Atkins about how we must, men must speak up. Well, I think everyone should speak up and not be an, a, an a-hole up. online. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But it's a bit of a dead end, I think, for um, particularly the the tribal supporters of Ardern and um, kind of a lot of middle class liberals saying, "Oh, all these deplorables are out there um, speaking, you know, badly, and you know they should be, you know, censored or something." I don't know. That's a dead end, isn't it? To, yeah. Uh, to, to to just turn this into another kind of culture war battle that, um, you know, we just need to condemn all the bad people. That yeah. will make things worse, not better. Yeah. Um, also, I thought a very interesting move, and, I, and I'll be honest, I had had some editorial discussion about how to handle this issue, uh, and we came to the decision to leave it alone if it had not broken this morning was the issue of the fact, and he addressed this, he front-footed this, Chris Hipkins, that he is separated from his wife, who he married, I think, around Christmas 2020. He is separated. He said, look, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to get this out there, I'm separated, I've got two kids, six and four, Um, let's not even say what their names are because it's not important, and he said, leave them alone, I'm not going to parade them around on social media, I'm not going to use them as political pawns and leave my family the hell out of it. I actually thought that, if you want to talk about progressing how we do politics, I actually thought that was a clever and justified move. Absolutely. It's the no-nonsense, Chris Hipkins. And it's also quite good when politicians aren't trading on their... uh, Mm. Which is in itself an implicit criticism Um, of of Jacinda Ardern, isn't it? Um... No, I think it's... Oh, come on. She used to FaceTime and Instagram with her child. I think it's more... Yeah, there's a criticism there that's a subtext. More, you know, it's a bit more, uh, yeah, deeper than, than that, I think. I don't think he's going out there to bash uh, Dern or... No. But yeah, you're, you're right in the sense that... It's he's going to do it different. Differentiating himself. He's going to do it different, and he's not into that sort of glamour, family, Clark, Gayford sort of stuff. No. Yeah, and in some ways, you know, the media thrust that upon people um, and people fall for it if they don't. And if, you know, misogyny or harassment was a factor, her harshest critics and the trolls would say she bought it on herself by pimping her family um, to the media uh, to a large extent. Chris Hipkins has clearly said he will not do that. And I imagine if he does... um, That'll be noticed. Okay, Bryce, I I, I know this is early days. Uh, Just the other thing, he's going to Ratna tomorrow, which with the the Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern, which will be her last, strangely, official engagement, will be attending the Ratna thing. He's sworn in Wednesday, and then he delivers the body blows on the Cabinet reshuffle, and I think has to break the news to the Maori caucus that uh, the time of Maori wonderfulness is over, or at least for the meantime. I'm going to end with with, with a final question to you. Nine months, no one's ever taken over. Uh, I heard Clint Smith saying today, no one's ever taken over in an election year as Prime Minister and won the election. Um, Generally, you'd say um, that he's not going to win, no matter what he does here, no matter what the reset for the Labour Party. It's still a hell of an ask, isn't it? 
Yeah, I guess that's what I've been thinking over the last week since Ardern um, resigned, that it's, it's, it's going to be too late, uh, too little. Uh, but then I saw Hipkins' press conference yesterday and I thought, mm. geez, maybe he has got it. You know him. what that is, Bryce? I've seen this. As I said, I've seen 10 incoming Prime Minister. That's called the little honeymoon. Slightly yeah. inspirational to see the new product on the shelf. Yes, but he has to go bigger. He has to do a big reset. Um, I don't think he'll get there if he just thinks. Yeah. Also, nice word. Um, indications are he is prime minister, and he was was one of the Labour people who'd come on the platform. He'll be on the platform probably from time to time. Well, he should be. He, yeah. he should be, and he'll probably go on other channels that the prime minister wasn't going on like news talk they'd be etc yeah yeah i i think this will be a reorientation to middle new zealand away from yeah, like i say away from greyland back to west auckland yeah in the heart hey bryce sorry for, for for getting you on the tools early enjoy your uh, anniversary day though i suppose you like me uh haven't yeah. had much rest the last few days no, not at all. We're, we're political tragics, but it's it's a lot of fun. It's yeah, bloody interesting. It is. Hey, Bryce, thank you, uh, and have a good day. That is Bryce Edwards, political lecturer at Victoria University and uh, also, of course, head of the Democracy Project, which does a whole lot of things about political debate. Uh, I think really, really good analysis.